Going through the licensure process to become a licensed architect is not easy. And going through the ARES, the architecture exams, is one of the most difficult times of the whole journey, especially because for many of us, we're in the age when huge life events are happening when we're going through the exams, like getting married and possibly becoming parents. And today on the show, I have Harp Cosgrove with me, who is going to share her incredible story about starting her exams and with two left becoming a mom. And her story is exceptionally incredible because she didn't have an easy, carefree pregnancy. She was actually bedridden and was told that she could not waste a single minute focusing on these exams because she had to take care of herself and her baby. And this is something that not many of us deal with. The exams themselves are already difficult, but then getting thrown something like that can kind of turn our world upside down. And so I love her story so much because not only does it show perseverance, but it shows how these exams can humble us and it can show us that life isn't about being perfect. It's about the journey and it's about discovering who you are. And so much of that happens in the process of becoming a licensed architect. So I cannot wait to introduce you to Harp. She's going to share her story. But before I dive into that, I want to give you a little intro about her. So she's from Central California. She went to school up there. She started her undergrad up in Fresno, and then she came down to New School of Architecture in San Diego, where she finished her degree in architecture. And then from there, she worked for some great companies down here in San Diego, like Rad Lab and Miller Hall. And then with her husband, they moved back over to Philadelphia. Then life got thrown to her like it does to many of us. And so she came back to California. And during this time, this is when she was kind of in the midst of her exams. And so she's going to tell you about how she dealt with the exams with the moving, with becoming a parent, with getting married, all these big life events and how that uh, affected her schedule and basically tips on how to efficiently study and get through the process. And she has some really great life lessons that she shares with us. So I know you're going to enjoy it. Please give a warm welcome to Harp Cosgrove. Everyone, welcome to Design Create Inspire. I'm very excited because today I have on the show with me Harp Cosgrove and she has such an inspiring, amazing story about becoming an architect and her journey and parenthood and so many amazing things I can't wait to dive into and have her share her story. So welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. So I love to start off with just hearing a little bit about your story. So Maybe, I mean, you can go as far back as you want, but really kind of your architecture journey, how you got into it, um, and what that process has been like. Oh, um, at least for me, it started a really long time ago. I first learned about architecture when I was about nine years old. Um, Someone extended family friend had a daughter that was in architecture school and she had all her models in her house. And I just went over and was like, wait, you get to make dollhouses for school. That's like so cool. And I mean, at the time I was, um, you know, living on a farm, we didn't have internet, we didn't have cable, we didn't have anything to do. So I just kind of got busy with that idea and just kind of had a lot of fun exploring it as a kid, which I'm really grateful for because it let me have fun with it before it got serious. And, you know, every step of the way along the journey to like getting to architecture school, getting through architecture school, just kind of like confirmed more and more that this is what I am really good at doing. And what a relief because it was a long time coming. But yeah, it's something I've kind of just been aspiring towards since I was really, really young and uh, have challenges the whole way through. Um, After I graduated from high school, I couldn't get into any schools for anything. It was like a weird time to graduate in the recession. And with the way my stuff was set up, I was kind of coming in as a transfer student. So that's how I ended up at Fresno City College for a little bit. Um, Thankfully, they had a small program there that has grown a lot since. And crazily enough, now I teach there. Yeah, so that's how I ended up at Fresno City, kind of kept pursuing it. That's when I first learned about like accredited schools and NCARB and what it means to be an architect. And that's kind of when everything really clicked into focus for me and um, ended up transferring to new school and just kind of have been on a rampage to get this license since. (laughs) Okay, so I have so many questions already. Okay, you grew up 
on a farm where? Um, I'm in Central California. So Fresno is like our city. And then Sanger is the smaller town outside of that that I grew up in. I'm really proud of it. Um, Yeah, we grew up when I was growing up, it was um, raisins and grapes. And then it switched to almonds at some point. So just lots of open space and not a lot of anything else. It's so funny because you're the second person who I've had on the show who's from Northern California, like farmland, you know, middle of nowhere. And it's when people typically think of California, they think of palm trees and cities and fast paced, but there's so much of California that is open farmland. And I experienced that when I moved to Northern California for school, I rode through the almond orchards to get to college. And it's just like not anything people think of. So, yeah, but it's beautiful. I love it. I don't mind, you know, that everyone's not the biggest fan of it, but it's a special place for me, obviously. So happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes driving over the grapevine and when you first get into just the plains, there's not a whole lot there, but there's such beautiful pockets. Yeah. And we're lucky. We're a little closer to the mountains. It's gorgeous. I I really love it here. (laughs) Nice. I love that. So when you went to undergrad, you already had known that architecture was that career path, but you mentioned that you didn't really know like the gravity necessarily of what that meant. Is that kind of what you were saying? Like, did you understand like the whole licensing process and all that stuff? Yeah. So that kind of came when I was in city college, I got really lucky. Um, You know, after high school, I didn't have anywhere to go. Like I literally had no plans. It was very strange because I was top of my class and straight A student with always like a ton of ambition and direction. It was really a weird phase of my life to have nothing. Um, And we had a family friend that introduced me to the program chair by some miracle of connection. And he kind of just sat me down and was like, well, you know, you're welcome to pursue anything else. But if this is what you want to do, know that all these things are coming and you should be aware of those before you commit to this because you're kind of at a point in life where you can pick anything. You don't have to pick something that you thought you wanted. And it didn't scare me. Like it seemed like, okay, that's fine. I can handle that. I've gotten through a lot of exams in my life. I've gotten through a lot of things in my life. Um, What's another break from it and then try it again. So yeah, it didn't, it didn't really like unnerve me at all. That's good. And it was nice though, too, that you had someone kind of guiding you to let you know what that process was like, because I feel like it's kind of new to a lot of people. They're like, wait, what do you mean? I have to have all these extra things afterwards. So what did your, (laughs) yeah, exactly. So what did your um, timeline look like after that? So you, did you start your master's right after your undergrad or did you go to new school for undergrad? I went for undergrad only. Oh, okay. That's why our paths never crossed while we were there because I was in the undergrad program full time. And then I was always, if you saw all those AIS posters around campus, those were all me. (laughs) Um, I kind of got caught in at the the right time with a bunch of people being really active there. But I did undergrad there. And um, I did not get my or pursue my grad degree after that. So I just stopped with undergrad at school. Yeah, no need to. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) if you don't need it, don't need it. The only reason I ended up doing it is because my undergrad was in interior design and not architecture. So okay, so what did your process or your path look like after you graduated? Were you like right into the exams or did you give yourself a break or what did that look like? Yeah. Um, again, like the timing of like having that two year extended break after high school, kind of like through the normal timing off for someone to be finishing grad school or undergrad school. Sorry. Um, I ended up getting engaged, got married, needed to breathe for a minute. So a couple of years went by with just like, just take a break. A lot happened right now. And, uh, you know, just kind of tried to soak it in for a little bit. And I knew what was coming. And I knew once I started, I wanted to be really committed to it and see it all the way through with no stops because that's the kind of person I am. But, um, you know, we stayed, um, my husband and I met at new school. We stayed in San Diego for a couple of years, worked around town and then had some unfortunate family events going on that led us to move to his hometown in Pennsylvania. Uh, we ended up moving to Philly. So we lived there for a couple of years and that's really where I started to get into the exams, get into getting my license. Um, at that point I had already knocked out most of my IDP hours and, um, was well on my way to like, just not them out. So how do you feel that that helped set you up for the exams taking that break? I think critical. <laughs> um, the exams are such a marathon. It's not a sprint. And knowing that and I, I mean, at the time, it was still 4.0. And I heard that they were switching to 5.0. And I know some people were really trying to jump on the train to like drop that one exam. But I was just like, that sounds like too much for me at this time. And I just knew it would be better for me to just take a break, take a breather, catch my breath after, you know, five years of very intense design school 
school and just kind of get ready for the next step. And I'm, I'm really grateful I did it that way. It gave us time to adapt to life. Like a lot of life happens in these years. Like I, I think that's the biggest thing that I didn't expect was, you know, you say the exams, you say the path, you say the route that you need to go. And then you kind of forget like, oh yeah, those are kind of the years that all these big life things happen. And uh, it can be really intimidating to figure out how to get through all of it together. Yeah, it is so true. And it's so much of architecture school takes our energy and our attention away from our friends, our family, all that stuff. And so then diving right into the exams can do the same. And so taking that little break is really helpful. And it's, I love hearing other people's stories because I give my perspective of what worked for me, but it's nice to hear of what worked for other people too, because it does make sense to take a little break for a bit, work, have those big life experiences and actually be able to really enjoy them too while you're doing that, which is huge. Yeah. And especially like if anyone like me, like you're all in, like you go into that cave and we don't come out. So yeah, with how everything played out with the exams, it was very unexpected and I'm just happy that I got through it. Well, so yeah, what was that process like for you for your exams? Like what did your timeline look like? Do you have any strategies or any helpful tips or anything? Yeah, of course. Um, Okay. The firm that I started working with in Philly, I actually picked them because on their website, they had some award for like helping employees progress in their careers or something. And that's kind of how I made my decision between a couple of places. And I'm so glad I did. Um, They had so much set up in advance um, that really all I had to do was kind of like step in and look around and kind of decide which way I wanted to go. It wasn't so much groundwork for me, which was such a relief because it looked really overwhelming with those giant lists of reading material and endless chapters and forums. And yeah, it's really overwhelming when you first jump in. So we kind of, there was like a group of us, um, group of women that kind of went through it together. And um, when I started, I had already done in my years off, I kind of did some light reading just to get an idea of like, well, where are the boundaries on this? Like, how far are we? How big are we talking? How detailed are we talking? I think I read Ballast in those two years that I kind of took off just kind of at my own pace. And uh, by the time we started taking our exams, I kind of had an idea of like, this is how I want to do it. I wanted to take them in six months that was the plan or at least within a year like attempt in six and then at least within a year have touched all of them um i started at the end of 2019 and then i think i had one unexpected fail which really threw me off my game for a minute and then life continued happening and then i had to just kind of pick it up and put it back down and then covid and pick it up and put it back down it was really a, a le- lesson in like life for me on how to adapt to what you're given um and then somewhere in the end of that is when i got pregnant and had the unexpected pregnancy of, you know, all the challenges that came with that. And that really put things on hold. (laughs) So where were you at? uh, What exam or how many did you have left when you got pregnant? So I had two left PPD and PDD. That's how I set mine up. Um, I had already prepared for them. I already had them scheduled. They were within a month of each other. Like I was ready. And then we found out we were pregnant at the end, beginning of October. And my exam was at the end of October. And by the time of the end of the exam time, I was already really, really unwell and mm-hmm. didn't, I just didn't know what was going on. So I just kind of went on with it. And then, then I got told like, no, we're, we're taking a big break from this. So yeah. So are you comfortable sharing your story a little bit yeah. about that, about yeah. um, your pregnancy and the unexpected things that you ended up facing? Yeah, I had hyperemesis throughout my pregnancy. It was really advanced uh, at the beginning for me. Um, I think for some people, it doesn't come into a little bit later, but mine just came in real strong, real fast at the beginning. And basically with hyperemesis, you're unable to eat, drink, really do anything. I couldn't look at my phone. I couldn't watch TV without getting sick. Like everything would just put me off my game. So somehow I probably through just sheer determination managed to sit through my exam. I vividly remember taking the exam. It was at the same testing center that I'd gone to for all my other exams. And um, at some point, I, I kind of knew like, this isn't going to be a pass, like we just need to wrap this up and get home. And then the next day, I had to go to the ER because it had been too many days had gone by um, now where I was um, vomiting and just couldn't keep any water down. And thankfully, my husband always with a clear head, like something's not right, we got to call the doctor, you know, it was too early for any of my checkups. That's the crazy thing is, you know, they don't normally see you till you're 10 weeks. And I was only eight, or six or eight at that point. And it was just too severe. So after all that, they told me, you know, you can't spend a single calorie on anything but making your baby. And that's when we kind of had to put everything on hold. I took a long extended leave from work. And at the end of all of that is how we ended up making our decision to move back to California. Wow. It's so hard because, you know, 
deciding to have a baby in the first place is a big decision. And, you know, when it's unexpected too, it's even more of like a, oh my gosh, that's, I mean, in my case, I, um, we knew we were going to be getting pregnant, but we didn't realize we'd get pregnant so soon. So you may have seen me walking around new school, like eight months pregnant. I remember this actually. Yeah. So I was, uh, I gave birth right in the middle of my thesis year and it was so unexpected, so wonderful, but it does throw a whole new level of difficulty into it a whole new level of, you know, your, yeah, if a guy has a wife who's pregnant, it can still be difficult to go through the whole process. There's new added stressors, but they're not physically sick or in bed or having to be told you actually have to put this on hold. And that must have been not only physically difficult, but I'm sure mentally difficult as well. Oh, completely. I, um, I mean, um, I will clarify on one thing that we were expecting her. We just didn't expect for it to go off the rails. It just, um, <laughs> when we were, you know, preparing for this, we thought, well, there's two left, you know, how bad could it be? We could make this work. And um, I think everyone at the time just thought like, it would be a typical pregnancy, and you could get through it, and it would be okay. But it mentally, it was absolutely soul crushing. I was kind of reaching this good point in my career, getting comfortable at the office, making the right moves at work, and everything was really starting to come into place. And then to have to take a step back from all of it abruptly, unexpectedly, um, it was a really, really tough uh, uh, pill to swallow on that one yeah. but it, it I had to kind of stop that's kind of where I first started like really understanding separating like identity work like it's tough because architecture is inherently personal you are taking a stamp saying my idea is the idea it's gonna be personal but it was kind of the first time that I was like we really need to start looking at like who we are beyond this because there's a good chance this could not finish and this could not happen yeah and that is such a good point that we do wrap so much of our identity into architecture being architects and you know, it's not just like another job. It's a lifelong career that we've strived to do. We strive to be, be there. We are architects. And so it's like, I am an architect. It creates this whole underlining identity. And there is value in separating that and realizing, well, that is my job. And there is life and importance, my health, my baby's health, my relationships, all that stuff that is is really important that can easily be pushed aside when we're especially going through the exams because like you're saying if you have this if you have this uh, timeline of six months it's like I don't care if I'm not eating or if I'm sick for a week I'm gonna get this done and and so it's like your husband's like uh uh like we're going to the, you're not okay <laughs> yeah I don't know uh, yeah I don't know how uh, you know you just get really like on a, on a mission at some point and I was just I knew I was so close and I was so scared of not being able to finish it I was really really scared of it just being one of those things that like well, this just doesn't happen now. Yeah. So thankfully, that was not how it worked out. Well, yeah. And so I want to talk about that, because I think this is a really inspiring story for so many women, especially who there's a big drop off of women who start their exams and then don't finish. And a lot of that drop off happens around childbearing ages or like, you know, the end of the 20s. And I see it and I hear it all the time from women that they, they started, but then they started a family. And you know, it's once you start a family, it's just it can be hard hard to get back into it and even back into the profession in general. And so I think it's so important for people to hear that you had two exams left and you had to take this break, um, but that you still persevered through it. So what did it, that look like after you had your baby? So I unfortunately had a really tough time. I mean, I guess it's to be expected with how challenging the pregnancy was. My postpartum um, journey was really, really challenging. And uh, it took me over a year to kind of come back out of that fog. And uh, it was strange, like I on a, you know, I'm just like being a woman and having a baby, not remembering making that baby, not re remembering the pregnancy. It was very disorganized orienting to suddenly be like, here's your baby, you've been awake for one month, because I think around month seven and a half, I kind of started feeling better. And then I had her at eight and a half. So really disorienting having a baby after such a challenging pregnancy, I was just in bed asleep most of the time. And then postpartum was really, really tough. I was really starting to kind of come down on myself about like, you know, we were so close, we almost finished. And now you're learning to be a mom, you're learning who this baby is, you're learning who are you away from architecture, because it's something I've done for so long. My friends who've known me my whole life have known me to be oh harp wants to be an architect so 
really challenging to kind of accept all of that, embrace all of it and just be like, this is just where we are. And we can make the decision to keep going or we can make the decision to walk away and whichever way we go, it's going to be okay. And I think that's the biggest thing I would love to say is just that like, just because someone did it doesn't mean everyone can. It's everyone's experiences and choices and influences are all different. But I know at the time for me, I just needed desperately to see that it could be done and uh, uh, making the decision to finally, you know, I think it was, um, she was just about to turn a year old when I was like, okay, I'm ready to start again. And um, I was a stay at home mom for that whole year. Also really challenging, um, you know, to be away from the social network of having an office and coworkers and, you know, with COVID still raging on, it was very isolating and having left an office where there was a big group effort and there was like this whole group of us that were all kind of going through it together and to kind of have to like sit down at home alone and be like, okay, how do we get through this now? Um, I'm really lucky that so many of my friends are teachers locally. Um, They all had their summer breaks off. So they would take turns kind of helping watch uh, my daughter Maya while I would, you know, run out to Starbucks or go somewhere for just a few hours at a time and really try to get what I could done efficiently, effectively, and then get back home. I mean, yeah, it's the postpartum world is unlike anything. And I was the same way. I feel like I blacked out the first year. And like, once a year hits, you can finally start to breathe again. Um, My second daughter is a year and a half right now and so I feel like I just came out of that again with the second one and each time it is it is hard and it's there is a fog and so I am glad that though you took that little bit of time to kind of recoup especially with being so sick and and all that I mean first of all yes being a stay-at-home parent I don't know how people do it like I'm I mean I'm stay at home I sometimes I was with my first it's so hard but also then finding that time during that to study when you have a kid that is latched on to you. And so what advice do you have for new parents or people maybe even with kids under five who are trying to fit in time to study? Because I hear all the time, I'm a new parent or I I have a three-year-old. I just literally don't have the time to do it. So any advice or ways that any hacks that you had that worked for you? Of course. I think the biggest thing is you don't need 40 hours a week to study. That was like the biggest shift in my preparation for exams pre and post baby. Pre baby, I would like come home, start reading at like 530, finish reading at around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and be like, that was a good study day. With a baby, that's just completely unfeasible. First of all, you're just trying to keep up with them. I mean, she's a toddler now, and I'm terrified at how many, how much energy she already has. So that's coming. But you know, once you have a baby, you just your brain is divided forever. Like you're always going to have one mind on this, one mind on everything else. And you know, it's really just a matter of like accepting, like, okay, realistically, what do I have? Do I have a weekend? Can I get a few hours? How can I use those few hours? And I think that's really just how I got through the whole rest of the exam. Um, well, all th- well, three because then I had to add the California one now. But really, that's that was the biggest shift was I didn't need as much time to study anymore. At this point, you know, you especially if you've already kind of started, you have a big net that kind of casts over all of the content, and it starts to get a little bit repetitive, or at least a little bit more refined. It's not new stuff all the time forever. And I kind of was reaching this point where it was like, we've talked about these things, just not in detail. So we just need to get into the detail now. And I would find honestly, I was probably only spending about four hours a week studying leading up to these final exams, because that's all I had, I would squeeze it in on a weekday twice, maybe. And then if not, then it would get moved to the weekend. And that's kind of how I plan my flexibility into it was realistically, I can make a million schedules, but my baby's going to do what she's going to do. And I really can't control that. So building in those unexpected challenges, building in like knowing things don't go to plan, no matter how hard we try, like um, kind of preparing for that in advance made a big impact on how I ended up being able to study and really getting out of the house was the biggest influence, you know, just I don't know how dads go through this. But as a mom, for me, my bright is always running. The list is always ticking. And as much as I want to say I'm not going to do the dishes, as much as I want to say I'm not going to do laundry or whatever it is that needs to get done, I'm going to because I'm looking at it. I'm sitting in it and studying is not fun anyway. So, you know, that kept happening. And that's kind of when we figured out like, okay, maybe I need to go to a coffee shop or somewhere where I can just take a couple hours, drink, have that drive to kind of decompress, get there and then just get to work. And in terms of actually working, you know, I started, I was 
like scouring through the forums to see what would get picked up the most, like who would make the same referral how many times. And if it wasn't more than five people saying they used it, I didn't bother because there's just too much. That list that NCARB, you know, gives out is endless and thousands of pages of reading that I just wasn't going to be able to get to. So um, I just paired that with whatever practice exams I had and really just tried to poke holes through what I didn't know. And as soon as I narrowed it down, a lot of it was just trying to eliminate what I already knew. Let's not waste time. Like I have no time. So I kind of had this system of um, labeling all of my questions as a one, two or three. I can't remember what I say, but I, I think it was something along the lines of like, one, I already know it, skip it. Two, I kind of know it. I know I got it wrong, but I think I know how to fix this in my memory. And then three was like, I have no idea what this is and we need to start from zero. And, you know, as quickly as I could, I would address the twos. And then as, as much time as I needed, I had the threes. And that's where I would dive into YouTube videos on one and a half speed or podcasts or like anything I could find. And I did not stick to NCARB at that point. I was like, nope, whatever anyone out there in the world has said about this topic, I'm going to go find it because I have... 30 minutes left before I have to go home. So yeah, even if it's like a contractor on YouTube, you know, sometimes those are the best, the best resources. Air conditioning mechanic. Yes, yeah. please tell me how this works. Um, <laughs> but that was the, the biggest shift in my approach, you know, before having a kid and after. And I just remember I was always looking on the forums and everyone would be like, oh, I, you know, spent this many hundreds of hours and I read all these books and I'm like, that's just not going to happen for me. And yeah, well, and I remember seeing Excel sheets that people would log their hours. I'm like, I don't even have time to log my hours. I mean, maybe if I wanted to, but it's like, it's, it's not worth your time. And I love that you're saying that because it is possible to not spend every waking moment and not read every single resource front to back and still pass. And it's really about like what you're saying is about efficiency and really diving deep into what you don't know, but doing it efficiently. And I I think that that's exactly parenthood. It forces you to release perfection, even if you don't want to. And it creates efficiency because you have to. And so it's like, it pushes you into this new realm. And I think it also does create a fire, at least for me, it did too. Like, I'm going to get this done as quickly as I can, because I don't want to be so focused away from the family. So in a way, parenthood could kind of help get, create efficiency, get it done. It's not easy, yeah, though. I, I agree. That's kind of funny. Right. I do know that I fail. I know I failed one of my exams during this and it was soul crushing because I was like, I just wasted, you know, two months. It wasn't two months. It was probably a collective of like 20 hours, but it felt like I wasted two months of everyone's time. And I just, you know, had to kind of regroup. That was PPD. So that was the one I had failed before I had to stop taking exams. And that was my first retake and I failed it again. It was just like, I have never failed anything, let alone failed anything twice in my life. Like this was, you know, the end of the road for me. But we, uh, we did get through that. We just kind of had to, again, just like embrace the imperfection and just roll with it and keep going. <laughs> yeah, and know that even when it feels like a wasted two months, it's never waste because that information is diving deeper and it's not going anywhere, building on top of it. And the one thing we have going for us when it comes to taking longer to take the exams is your gaining experience at work. All of that information, especially if you're like really trying to advance in an office and you want to grow as like that more management role, you're learning all of this stuff daily. It, it's I think it can be intimidating to think, oh, there's these exams, everyone fails, they're so hard, they're so long, but it's what we do. I mean, not everyone does it all the way, you know, right at the beginning, and maybe some people haven't touched it in several years. But at the end of the day, these are words we know, these are words we use, these are things we see. So even if you're starting a little bit later, you just did your studying in the office. That's how I would treat it. Yeah, I love that. It's a great way to do it, or a great way to look at it. So what advice would you have for someone who maybe has started their exams, but you know, like most of us are in their maybe late 20s or early 30s and are wanting to start a family? What would you say to them? Yeah, it's uh, it really, we really get the short end of the stick on that on when we're kind of hitting that milestone of like, yeah, we're ready to take exams. 
but we also have to do this huge life thing too. I think the biggest advice I would have at this point is like, you can't put your life on hold for something that is, it's real, but it's a job. It's not what the life memories are that you, you know, have on your deathbed type of thing. That was like a really big lesson to learn that like, yeah, okay, in architecture school, we put everything and everyone on hold to go be in studio and just be in this little cave of design. But how long can you really sustain that? And I don't think that is how you should go through exams. Exams are a part of life and they should be treated as a part of life and not your whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, It can be challenging to have to deal with that. I mean, thankfully, the rolling clock got eliminated. That was my big worry because I was kind of coming up close on mine with the, you know, having to take two years off just for health reasons Mm -hmm. alone. And then, you know, you fail one, you fail it again, they extend the probation period. And it was really kind of coming down to the wire for me. Um, I'm really glad that's gone, but at least in most states. Um, But I would just say that like life is going to continue happening, regardless of if you take these exams or not. And the best thing you can do is incorporate it as a part of your life. Just know that it's going to be there, know that you're gonna have stuff going on, plan around it as best as you can, and really just try to be dedicated to it when you're in it. You can't dedicate yourself 24 seven for 365 days. So commit to what you're going to commit to, and then see it through. And hopefully, you pass. And if not, welcome to the rest of us. Like we've all been there. Yes. Welcome to what it's actually like to take the exams. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's a wild, wild ride. Well, it's so amazing that you persevered through it. Your daughter's healthy now and you did it and you finished. So when did you pass your last exam? Final ARE was in the summer. And then I had to take a little bit of a break for life stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I took my CSE in December. So I finished in December. And then because of how the renewal timelines work, I had to wait until January to file because that's my birthday. (laughs) And then yeah, they took uh, eight weeks, I want to say to get it back to me. So for eight weeks, I was just kind of like, don't think about it. It doesn't exist. It didn't happen. You're like, technically, I still can't call myself an architect, which is so ridiculous. But I am. (laughs) they give it to you on the paper and they explicitly say like you are still not allowed you're like really after all this please oh my gosh so how do you feel now? Is there a big weight off your shoulders? Are you, you're celebrating? Yes, we celebrated big time this weekend. We had my stamp party. It's something I had been looking forward to the whole that. time, basically. I was like, I know I'm going to have a stamp party and it's going to be epic. And it was. The weight, I really thought it would be like a miracle of like, oh, what now? But it's kind of like a fog. I think it took me so much longer than I expected. I really thought I would get in and out within a year, maybe a year and a half tops. And here we are three years later. And it's just kind of like how do I unlearn these habits of like having built up tension and you know you know as much as I was like studying away for like you know a couple hours at a time at night I would be taking practice exams on my phone while I could um it's like weird kind of to come out of that and learn how to have fun again (laughs) I think it's so good that you are saying that because I think sometimes we do expect like a whole shift to happen once we get our license it's like we're finally a licensed architect, but life kind of just continues on. And I had to actually like force myself to uh, celebrate and be really consciously appreciative of where I was because I felt that I'm like, okay, now what, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 appreciated. Like I have been wanting to get to this point for so, so long and I do. And now still I'm like, I can't believe that I'm here. I did it. And so I'll, I'll remind myself of it, but it is true that it's like, you know, life does continue on and now you have some extra hours in your day, but we're so used to this like routine. And there is something like the stressors that it creates this dopamine release because we're getting in there, we're taking our exams. It's not like we like it, but it does create something and so you know now leaving that behind it's kind of like okay well now I guess I you know what's the next goal post so it's good to just be happy with the now (laughs) yeah it's a it's been a good lesson in life and just all of those things kind of learning to just take a breath and just like hey we did it I definitely was a little hesitant for a bit about celebrating I was like no no one cares it took me too long it's kind of not a big deal people get their license all the time and my husband was like absolutely not we are having a giant party and you are going to be happy about it and I'm so glad we did everyone that came by was I mean at some point in my life they had heard me say that so it felt really good to finally be like oh we did it we all did it and you know so many of them were the ones helping me with my daughter and couldn't be more grateful yeah it really does take a village and I think that having a stamp party like you I had actually never seen people do that and so I'm like 
Is it too late for me to have one of those? Because I think it's a genius idea. Not. <laughs> Your cake had, she had a cake, and I, I'll see if I can steal the photo from her, but she had our cake with the actual stamp on it. And I think that that's just like such a beautiful way to celebrate. I, I have a coaching program called Mind Over ARE, and one of the things I talk about a lot in there is making sure to celebrate and celebrating every mi milestone, whether you pass or you fail, but having some sort of idea of a celebration before you even get in there and take it. And I think that that one that you had is like, I haven't heard anyone come up with that idea yet. I think it's just brilliant. So I love it. Yeah, I I, I can take most some credit for it. Uh, the office I worked at would do it in like a different way for everyone that would pass the I, I really loved working there at, at BRR Architecture in Philly, they uh, would have everyone come together on the back kitchen island. And the person who got their license would, you know, do their stamp on a paper and everyone would write little messages to them. It was just it was the best. I, I really missed that so much when I had to leave and come here and not having an office to celebrate with getting that and it was a little strange at first, but everyone came through and everyone made sure that it was a really good time and 12 out of 10 recommend I say you should throw yourself a renewal party whenever that comes up. Um, Mine was just in January. So maybe maybe it's time. <laughs> fully support that. <laughs> I love that. It's great to be a part of a supportive community like that too, like your old job, because I don't think people really do that. And it is something to celebrate and be proud of. So I love that. Definitely uncommon. Most people were not so fortunate to have that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think this is so wonderful. I think, you know, your story is just really beautiful and I know it'll resonate with so many people. So I do really appreciate you coming on here. And the way that Harp and I connected was that NCARB featured your story. You wrote like an open letter to mothers, right? Yeah. So um, after all of the struggle of getting through exams and figuring out how to study, all I could kind of feel at the end of it was just exhausted. And, you know, you hear all the statistics of all the people that don't pass. And then you hear all the statistics of women that don't pass. Then you all, you know, the moms that don't pass, it's just getting like worse and worse and worse. And all I like that's that was the loudest voice in my head as I was taking my final exams was like this number of new mothers don't finish. And I just remember thinking like, I just need to know I can do it. And I I think that's how I first came across your videos on YouTube. Um, not about ARE stuff, just your other blog posts. And um, I, I just remembered, like, you know, maybe I should leave something here. It's kind of like a little bit of a tradition that I saw people would post when they would pass their final exams, like, oh, six green squares or six check marks. And I just felt like I wanted to leave one for the other moms feeling the same way because I mean, many of us are at the same same point in our careers and lives. So I left a little open letter there called for the mamas and then and Carb reached out to me to do a little spotlight feature. Well, thank you for doing that because it is kind of like a funnel, you know, it's easy to not get through and get to that final thing and motherhood for sure is something that is really easy to push you away from it because it is freaking hard. Being a mom is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, even harder than the ARES or any of it. It's really, really hard. And trying to add on top of that architecture, which is, you know, arguably the hardest major and the hardest exams you have to go through, it is difficult. And so I think that especially the moms out there, especially when it's not just you have a baby, your body's changing hormones, like physiology is literally changing. And to have someone else out there to say like, hey, I went through it, it's hard but you can totally do it is sometimes that kick that people need to just get over that finish line. It's awesome. The fear of it, like it's so scary, but once you kind of start to dip your toe in and you see like, oh yeah, I can do this. I, I got this. It feels so much better. And even in offices, like most offices now, it's a little bit more balanced between men and women, but timeline, you're catching women and like you might be the only woman going through pregnancy. It's still isolating, still not the same as everyone else. Yeah, I mean, when you're also physically showing up, like um, I just mentioned the other day, day because on International Women's Day, a video came up of me two years ago when I was six months pregnant. And I felt so uncomfortable going to job sites and showing up as the architect. And I was super pregnant. And I look back and I'm like, I wish I didn't feel that way. And I wish that nobody ever has to feel that way. But sometimes it is. And it's silly because nobody ever judged me. I created great projects. I never had clients complain or anything. Um, but when you're pregnant, when you're a woman, you're physically showing up as a different form that can sometimes be looked at as a vulnerable time. So it's tough. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Harp. When you are not designing or architecting or studying anymore, how do you like to spend your free time? 
I love baking and I love being outside. I love um, every year I'll do special sugar cookies for all my friends with decorated royal icing. But otherwise, I love being outside. Thankfully, my daughter's an outdoor girl too. So as soon as the rain stops, we're outside in the puddles and having a good time with our dog. And usually my husband will tag along too. Nice. I love that. Okay, awesome. So where can people find you? Because I'm sure that, you know, if there's a young mom listening or maybe someone who is like wanting to maybe become a parent, maybe they want to reach out and just ask you a question or something. Where can people find you? Yeah, I have uh, my LinkedIn's open, I believe, for public. And um, you can message me on there. Otherwise, on Instagram, um, I'll give you my handle because it's a little tricky to spell. Yeah, give it to me and I'll put it all in the show notes and everything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here and stay in touch. And yeah, it's exciting. You did it. You're an architect. Done. (laughs) Done. Yes, thank you. And uh, can't wait to hear all the other stories from everyone else you have coming on. Yeah, definitely. All right, we'll talk soon. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for tuning in this week. I am so glad that you were able to catch Harp Story. It's so inspiring, so fascinating, and I really hope that someone out there gained some inspiration from it, especially if you are a new mom or interested in becoming a mom soon and you're in the throes of becoming a licensed architect. It's not easy, but it's totally possible. And please reach out to me or Harp if you have any questions or need some one's brain to pick or want to dive in deeper to the whole subject of being a mother, being pregnant while in the craziness of the licensing process. So thank you so much and I will see you next week. And in the meantime, check out this video and any of our previous episodes. All right, talk soon. Bye.